Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 24. I appreciate the Lord's presence, and I want to acknowledge that today. And I know we need His help, don't we? The last several weeks, uh, we skipped a few weeks. We looked at Matthew 13, those seven parables. And then we skipped a few weeks, and we jumped in here to Matthew chapter 24 and 25 on the Olivet Discourse. And I know that a lot of what I have preached and said in the last little while has not just been a direct gospel message, but the Lord honors His Word. He honors all of His Word. And it will not return void, but it will accomplish that whereunto He has sent it to do. And so I pray that the Lord will help us greatly today. I realize we do need His help. And I want to cover a lot of territory today. And uh, if I had time this morning, I would read Matthew 24, and I would begin at verse 45, and I'd read all the way down through 25 in verse number 30. But I realized that that would terrify you to death (laughs) if I read that much Scripture, so I will not. I have a little thought in mind, and I don't know that I'm going to call this that, but I feel like I ought to tell you kindly in which direction I'm going Uh, I want to talk about the characters of Christendom uh, today. Now, I know that's a big old word, Christendom, but basically it's the current age in which you and I live. It is this time period. Christendom implies both good and bad. And there are some good and bad in our world today, isn't it? Even in the professing Christian world, there are those who are genuine. And then, of course, we know that there are those who are not. We're living in a mixed age, and we have to understand that. A lot of people say, I won't come to church. I say, why? Because of hypocrites in the church. Well, I want to tell you something. There's hypocrites in the world. They're at work. They're at Walmart. They're everywhere you go. But to us who are saved, and we sometimes look, and we kind of get fooled and deceived, and we say, well, what's going on? I had great confidence in this work or that organization or that individual, and now they've let us down. Well, I think the Bible has the answer to it. And one of the things that characterizes our age, and Jesus talked about it in Matthew 13 with those seven parables, that there are tares among the wheat. There is leaven in the meal, which represents false doctrine mixed with that which is true. And in this net that we call Christianity, there are good fish and bad fish that are caught up in it as well. And I just am sort of country and backwoods in the way that I look at a lot of things, but I look at it a lot of times like this. There's nuts everywhere, and then there are religious nuts. And there ain't nothing as nutty as a Christian nut or a religious nut. Let me say it like that. Get my words and my terminology right. And my wife says that I'm a real draw for them. She said, if there's ever a nut comes through, she said, do you realize that they attach to you? And I said, I was beginning to see that. <laughs> Amen. Oh, uh, me. But uh, there's all kind of things in there, all kind of characters in Christendom. And so I want to begin with these verses and look at it with you for just a little bit this morning as the Lord would help us. I might ought to start by reading this first parable. Matthew 24 and verse number 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household uh, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom when his Lord when he cometh shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and to drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of. And he shall cut him asunder, and shall appoint him his portion with the hypocrites, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And that is the first of the three parables that Jesus gives in the scripture that I called to your attention this morning. Now, these three parables relate to the age of Christendom. And Christendom is not just pure Christianity, but it's the good and the bad and the ugly that is all combined. I'm aware that in this thing called Christendom, there is a true born-again church of God that loves the Lord, loves His truth, loves His word, that worships Him faithfully, 
And those are the ones that are going to be raptured when Jesus comes again. So these three parables relate to the age of Christendom. Now, how do we know that? Remember in the first 44 verses, we said Jesus was talking to Jewish disciples about the end of the Jewish age. He answers the questions, three questions they had. In verse number three, Jesus had predicted that the temple would be destroyed. And here in Matthew's account, the Lord ignores all of that. And uh, he tells us how the temple will be destroyed in Luke's gospel, the 21st chapter. They said, when shall these things be? That is the temple to be destroyed. And what shall be the sign of thy coming? That's their second question. And Jesus answers that here in the first 44 verses of chapter 24. And then at the end of the age, and Jesus talked about how the Jewish age would end with the appearance of the uh, Messiah, the Lord Jesus would come at the second advent. So he basically has answered their questions. And here in verse 45, the tenor of it changes. And now he puts forth three parables dealing with Christendom or you and I in this age and some of the things that we see. Now, how do I know he's dealing with Christendom? Let me give you four reasons. Number one, he's already answered their question uh, that they ask him in verse number three. Secondly, I know that this relates to Christendom because it is a mixed group. If he's dealing with Jews totally in the first 44 verses, then he's dealing with a mixed group. Notice, if you will, here in verse number 45. Who then is, notice he said, a faithful and wise servant. So you have the both of them together. Not just all wise servants or just evil servants, but a mixture of the two, if you will. And then notice, if you will, down in verse 25 and verse number 30. And 25 and verse number 30, this is what he says. He says, cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. So here uh, is a uh, unprofitable servant, but there are profitable servants. And I would also say that in Matthew chapter 25, you have the parable of the ten virgins. Five of them were wise, but mixed with five who were foolish. And so there we have that laid out for us. This, six, this section pictures Christ as delaying his coming. Whereas to the Jews, he tells them to be ready and gave them specific signs to know when he was coming. But notice the delay that is mentioned in these particular verses. Notice in verse number 48 of Matthew 24. But if that evil servant shall say in his heart, look at this, my Lord delayeth his coming. And notice also, if you will, uh, verse number, uh, chapter 25 and verse number 6. At midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Now notice that the Lord's coming is delayed all the way up to the midnight hour. Delay. Chapter 25 and verse number 19. It says that when he's dealing with these servants, and after a long time the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And I would remind all of us this morning that of all the dispensations of time, the church age, Christendom, we often call it the grace age, is the longest age of any we find recorded in the Bible. And, uh, you know, the grace age has lasted for nearly 2,000 years since Christ ascended back up into heaven till he comes in the rapture of the church. That's already been 2,000 years. And that in itself speaks that the Lord is leaving the door of grace and salvation open to many that they might believe on him, for he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Here it is, 2023, and our Lord has not returned. And he's giving people an opportunity to be saved. He could have come at any time in the last 2,000 two, uh, 2, years, but he's not done so. I'm glad the Lord did not come in 1966 because I didn't get saved until 1967. I'm glad that God opened the door of salvation to me and I had the opportunity to be saved. So delay is the thing that is mentioned in these three parables.
And then another reason I know that he's talking to us of this hour is there are no mentions of signs in these three parables. And you know, there are no signs given to the church. There are no signs in the Bible given to the church. Now all those signs that he mentioned back in Matthew chapter 24 where there will be wars, rumors of wars, nation rising against nation, and the sun darkened and the moon refusing to give her light, and pestilence and famines and earthquakes, those are all Jewish in nature. Uh, in nature. The Jews require a sign. It is the Greeks that seek after wisdom. So I know that this passage is dealing with something other than what it did in the first 44 verses. Very quickly, I want to mention these three parables briefly, and I hope you're acquainted. Most people are acquainted pretty well with these three parables. First of all, let's deal with this parable of the faithful and evil servants in verses 45 to 51 of chapter number 24. First of all, notice the contrast, if you will, in the appointment and attitude of both servants. It says in verse 45, a faithful and wise servant is appointed by his Lord over his household. And I think the household there represents the household of faith. Galatians 6.10, you and I that are saved, we are members of the household of faith. And God in his wisdom has directed and given men to help different congregations and to help the churches uh, as they need help down through these 2,000 years of time. I'm grateful for the pastor that I had who helped me, who gave me meat, fed me the word of God. In new season, God uses these men to help his people grow. And so he's appointed those throughout the age. And uh, notice it said, blessed is that servant that's doing what the Lord called him to do when he comes. Now, if you will, notice down in verse number uh, 48. It says, but and if that evil servant shall say in his heart. Now, it doesn't say the Lord appointed him to be the ruler of his household. Somebody said that they feel like every time God calls one preacher to preach, the old devil calls about ten that may be true. You do know, don't you, that everything that totes a Bible and wears a suit and tumbles out from under a bush somewhere is not God called. I believe there is a divine call to the ministry and God chooses men and selects them in every generation and sends them to help his people and to feed them. But here this evil servant just comes up, doesn't say that he was appointed, but notice uh, he begins to say in his heart, in other words, an inward attitude, and this is a, his attitude, that my Lord delayeth his coming. And I think that is a dangerous thing. I, I guess that sometimes the devil tempts all of us to believe. Does the devil ever come up to you and say, well, you know, you've been hearing that all of your life that the Lord was coming. Now, do you really believe that he's coming? Well, the evil servant, who is supposed to be feeding the household of faith, now comes up and he said, my Lord delays his coming. And as a result of that inward attitude, notice what his outward actions are. It says in verse 49, he shall begin to smite his fellow servants or to abuse them. And to be honest with you, I know a lot of preachers that are abusive to their congregations. And they feel like they have to offend them every time that they get up to preach. And uh, they often fleece the congregation, but rarely do they feed that. That is troublesome to me. And the evil servant, he begins to abuse his fellow servants. And uh, notice in verse 49, notice to eat and to drink with the drunken. Uh, his morals become loose. And it begins to eat and to be drunken, uh, to eat and drink with the drunken. Uh, he begins to hang around with the wrong kind of people. And I think a pastor ought to be careful who he associates himself with, don't you? Matter of fact, I think all Christians ought to be careful who they associate with. Tell me who your friends are, and I'll tell you who you are. Now, I think we ought to try to make friends of sinner people. ought to try to be a good influence on them. But there is a limit to your fellowship that you can have with unsaved and worldly people. 
and begins to fit in and to act like them. And you know, the Bible says in the book of 1 John chapter number 3, listen to what it says. Verse number uh, 2 says, Beloved, right now we, all of us, are the sons of God. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he, Christ, will appear in the rapture of the church, then we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now that verse says that right now we have a relationship with the Lord Jesus. It is not complete. We're not all that we're going to be, but we have this hope, don't we, church, that when Christ comes at the moment we see him, we hear the trump of God, we're going to be glorified and perfected at that point in time. We're going to be like him. We're going to see him as he is. And listen to verse number three. And every man that hath this hope of his second coming purifieth himself even as he is pure. So what does that mean? What you believe about the second coming of Christ is a great inducement to live a holy and a godly life. Now, my mother, this seems funny and this seems so antiquated, my mother wouldn't let us go to the movies when we were kids growing up. And, uh, you know, they have Disney movies on. And by the way, Disney's changed a little bit, hadn't they? Maybe my mama wasn't so dumb after all. But anyway, she wouldn't even let us go. We could watch Walt Disney on the television on Sunday. And I said to her, I said, Mama, what's the difference? She said, well, you go down to the movie theater and you go in there and watch Walt Disney. She said, remember that in the theater next to you, they're showing R-rated stuff in there. Might hurt your testimony. She always cared about what people thought about her. And she said, what if somebody comes by and sees you coming out of the movie house? They're not going to know if you went to watch Walt Disney or, or if you went to that R-rated movie. I said, well, I don't care what they think. I'm going to watch them walk Disney. But she did have a point, didn't she? Huh? Now, we have to admit that. See, our society has changed. This happens gradually, but slowly. It changes that. But Christians, let me encourage you to always remember this, that our Lord could come at any moment. Don't be found in a place where you would not like to be found if Jesus were to come. For he said, doesn't he, in 1 John chapter 2, I believe it is in verse number 28, that we should be confident and not be ashamed before him at his coming. And so I see in this evil servant a result of his attitude. He began to abuse his fellow servants and to live loosely. Let me say this. Let's live in the light of our Lord's coming. It could happen at any moment. We don't know when that is. There are no signs given to us as a church. I think the thing that determines when the Lord comes is one day the last soul is going to be saved that makes up the complete body of Christ, the building, the spiritual habitation, and the last person is going to be saved, and God's going to say to his son, Son, go get your bride. She's now complete and be presented to him. So that is basically that parable. Now, secondly, I want to talk about the wise and the foolish virgins, beginning in chapter 25 and verses 1 to 13. In this group, there is also a mixture of true and false. Notice they all appeared the same. They were all virgins. Maybe they were all good morally. There's a lot of folks think that if I live a good moral life, then God will accept me. There's a lot of people that think that if I do good works, then uh, uh, God will accept me. No, you have to be born again. That is the key to it. And they all appeared to be the same. Uh, moral, upright. They weren't adulteresses. They were virgins. Uh, they weren't drunks or deadbeats or harlots. They were moral and upright. But it was revealed at the midnight hour where the bridegroom appeared and the Bible says that the foolish had no oil in their lamps. Now, I know you're not supposed to press a parable for every detail, but I think that that all very well could represent the Holy Ghost. And you take a saved person and an unsaved person and just stand them on the street side by side, 
they may both be well dressed and you outwardly looking could not tell who had the Holy Spirit living in their hearts and who did not. And the same way with these virgins, and that characterizes the age that we live in. And even those of us who know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior do not live perfect, sinless lives. Can you imagine how it would be to an unsaved world looking at the church? And they don't know really the difference between the two many times. But it was revealed at the midnight hour, the foolish had no wall. They were not true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. They did not possess the Holy Spirit of God. And at midnight, at a late, late hour, uh, then went forth the cry, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And boy, that is a wonderful cry, isn't it? And we preach that a lot. Most gospel preachers do. That the Lord is soon to come. The midnight cry at the last hours. And, uh, you know, I've often thought about that. Look back through church history. And all of the apostles of our Lord talked about the Lord's soon appearance. They talked about the rapture of the church. The Lord coming for his own. But when the scripture closes out, even if you're a student of church history, you do not see much mentioned anymore about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was a message that seems to have been lost for some 1,900 years. Can you imagine that? And, uh, you know, the great preachers of the 1800s, uh, Charles Spurgeon, great, great preacher, great preacher of the gospel, but rarely did he refer to the book of the Revelation for they did not understand prophecy. But about the 1890s, 1900, there began men to come on the scene and they began to understand prophecy in the book of the Revelation. And they went back and visited some of those old doctrines and they began to preach that the Lord Jesus was soon to come. The imminent appearance of Christ for his own. And think about it, for about 1900 years, that message was almost overlooked. And you say, well, why was that? Well, the theologians of that day, they had other things that occupied their attention. I think about it in the 1500s with the Reformation. Men like Luther and Zwingli, they began to see that great truth about how they were saved by grace through faith and that alone. And that propelled what we call the Reformation and the birth of what we call the Reformed Churches and I even brought about reform in the Catholic Church to some degree. So great was that truth and that theological truth that we're saved by grace and grace alone. But the thing that has transformed us and the thing that has caught our attention in the last hundred years is that our Lord Jesus could come at any moment. And to the church we say, look up, your redemption draweth nigh because we're living in the hour, I believe, when Jesus is soon to come. And so that's been the cry. And also there is a great warning in verse number 10. As that cry goes out, the Bible says that the foolish, they went to try to buy oil for the lamps. And while they went, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready, those who already had the oil, possessed the Holy Spirit, went in with him to the marriage. And notice, and the door was shut. So shall it be in the end of this age that when Jesus comes, the door of salvation will be forever closed to those who have heard and understood with the help of the Holy Spirit the preaching of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about that, folks. We better do all that we can to get our loved ones into church while the door is open. One day it's going to be shut just as sure as Noah entered into the ark. As far as I can tell from reading that text of Scripture, God said to Noah and his family, you come into the ark. And Noah and his family went into the ark. And for seven days the gangplank remained open. And nobody besides Noah's family entered into the ark. But on the seventh day, bam, God slammed the door shut. Sealed it up, and the floodwaters began to come. So that is the wise and the foolish virgins. Quickly, profitable and unprofitable servants, beginning in chapter 25 and verse number uh, 14 down through verse number 30. The first parable that I talked about this morning dealt with service within the household of faith. 
This one deals with service in the world. He calls three men, and he gives to them talents. To one he gives three, to another he gives two, and to the third one he gives one. And the Bible says that he gave them to every man, verse 15, according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Now, there is a difference in a talent and an ability. Now, ability uh, is God-given, I think, as well. Some folks have what we call natural ability that God can and does use. God uses personality, and each of us are different, so God uses that. But when God calls a person to do anything, he also equips them to do what it is that he's called them. And he does it according to our abilities. Now, I may look at myself and say, oh, I'm much more able and capable than somebody else. But God might not look at it that way. He may see you as more talented, uh, more gifted, and more able than myself. So he gives out talents. I think talents are the opportunities to serve God. Somebody asked Dr. Billy Graham, said, Dr. Graham, you must be uh, looking forward to the judgment seat of Christ when you go before the Lord and get rewards for all the people that you preach to. And he said, listen, God gave me opportunities that he did not give to other men, and I shall answer for those come judgment day. And I believe that that is the case. So it's the opportunities, if you will. So there are different talents or opportunities. And... Uh, God requires each one faithfully to one he gave three and a day of reckoning, a day of accounting came and he goes to the man that he gave the three talents to. And he said, what have you done with that which I gave you? He said, I went and traded them and said, here, Lord, here's three talents that I gained besides the one that you gave to me. And God looks at him and said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Been faithful over a few things, I'll now make you ruler over many things. He goes to the fellow that had the two talents and he says to him, what did you do with the talents, the opportunities I gave you? He said, I tried to use them wisely. I invested them and now here are two more beside and he too was blessed uh, equally with the fellow that had the three. Now let me ask you, which one of them did God bless the most? Did he bless the guy that had three talents more than he blessed the guy that had the two talents? No, he blessed them equally because they were equally faithful to him. He goes to the guy that has the one talent, and he says to him, he said, what did you do with that talent that I gave to you? He received the, verse 24, he that received the one talent came and said to the Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid and went and I hid my talent in the earth and lo, there you have that that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not and gathered where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers that then at my coming I should have received my own with usury or at least with interest. Take therefore the talent from him and give it to him that had ten talents. And so here's a principle laid down to us that says this. And it is the fact that if we do nothing with the opportunity that God has given to us, he may take those away from us and allow another person to have that. As a matter of fact, I doubt if this third fella was even a Christian. And that's what marks the age that you and I live in. I don't know who's saved and who's not. And I'm going to be honest with you, I don't go around worrying about that all the time. If you tell me that you're saved by God's grace, I will take you at face value at your testimony. You ought to live like it. There ought to be fruits in your life that you are a Christian. But who am I to tell you that you're not saved? I don't know. I don't have that authority. And I don't have the ability to tell. But I want to tell you something. One day, I'd remind all of us that our judge, the Lord, will come. And we're everyone going to give an account of the opportunities that we had to serve him. And there is a principle in the Bible that to whom much is given, much shall be required. And uh, that may be all that I need to say about that. But I'll tell you something, that pretty well sums up, doesn't it, how things are in our day and our time. The characters of 
Christendom. This is a broad field that we're in. Do not be deceived. Do not be fooled. Uh, everything that says they're a Christian is not. And do not be discouraged when you see those who bring shame and reproach upon the name of Christ. I don't know about you, but I think in these hours I have a desire to be more genuine than I've ever been before. I mean just be genuine and real and love people and preach the gospel. You say not many people is being saved. I know they're not, but that doesn't change the gospel. That does not change our responsibility. It is required in a steward that a man be found faithful. You may have a lot of opportunities and a lot of abilities that I don't have. But listen, God is going to judge us accordingly. And he is going to reward us equally. Be faithful in all that God asks you to do. Especially here before he comes again. Standing to our feet, please. Our head. Thank you.